Hello, everyone, and welcome to Carnivorous Chats. I'm really privileged and honored to have this guest on the show today. This particular guest was very instrumental in my journey, and we're going to get into how she was. I am welcoming Monique Attinger. Monique is a holistic nutritionist. She is one of the wizards of ox. I absolutely love that name, by the way, Monique. It's perfect. <laughs> it is absolutely perfect. The wizards of ox. And she has 15 years plus experience in helping people with low oxalate diets. Welcome to Carnivorous Chats, Monique Attinger. Oh, thank you for having me. This is great. I, you know, I'm always about getting the word out so that people can dodge this bullet, right? You are so right. And what a big bullet it can be. And we're going to get into the details of what, how it can impact us from a dietary perspective that then turns into physical and sometimes mental. Oh my goodness. Oxalate can be a culprit in so many things. With that being said, Monique, I wonder if you could do the listeners a favor. Now I've heard your journey before, but for those folks that are new to you, could you give a little bit of background of how you got into oxalates in the first place? I really love this, this story because it's really interesting. Well, I, I, I am definitely going to do the Reader's Digest condensed version because it can. there's a lot that was sort of in the in-between steps. But essentially, my then about two and a half year old daughter was having these rashes and they went down the back of her legs. She was having pain on urination her we were in the midst of the whole potty training thing and so I was noticing how red and raw her tissues looked and I was also noticing that when I did things like apply zinc cream just to try and help everything settle down and sometimes she would just weep it was it, it I knew there was something going on I didn't want you know, big drugs for a little, a little one. So I took her to our trusted naturopathic doctor at the time. I explained, you know, not my first rodeo seems to be like yeast, but it's not like yeast. We've got these rashes, they come and go, you know, sometimes she seems okay, then she's awful. And he looks at me and she's, and he says, I think she has an oxalate problem. And what stands out in my memory from that is what I looked at him and said was, what's an oxalate? And that was really what kicked us off into this journey. I knew nothing about oxalate. And I was what I would consider at the time a reasonably savvy um, consumer eating a reasonably good diet. And I had no idea how much oxalate was in our diet. So I said to my daughter, who at two and a half was already showing signs of being maybe a little bit stubborn like her mother. And I said, you and I are going to do this diet. And we're going to figure out just how good it is. And never have I said anything more prophetic in my life. Because I was not a very healthy specimen at that point. I was actually um, in the process of starting to deal with my health issues. I hadn't done anything about my health issues while she was little because I was nursing. And I didn't want to introduce something into... Uh, the breast milk that could affect her, right? But I went, okay, I really have to do something because I was going to round the corner to 48 and I thought, I really thought I wasn't going to live to see my kids grow up, which is a very sad thought. So I start on this diet and at that point in time, I had low thyroid, I had low adrenals, I had almost like fibromyalgia coming on, my whole body kind of ached, I couldn't sleep at night, I'd fall asleep dead at like nine, I'd wake up at one, I'd be awake till four or five, I'd have to roll out of bed half dead to deal with kids. And, and I was working part time at the time, it was just, it was insanity, right? And so we get on this diet, and all of a sudden, I see all the things that are going on in my life all start to improve at the same time. And I went, what is that? And that's how I essentially like overhauled my entire life. It's not just that I follow a low ox like diet. It's not just that I have healthy kids I fledged who understand their diet and are, you know, when they were little, my son also had lots of problems with asthma and allergies and things like that. Turned out it was related to oxalate, got him off oxalate, his stuff started to clear up. So from a parenting standpoint, being able to fledge healthy adults, that's right up there. And from a personal standpoint, went from think I'm going to die before they're grown ups at 48 to, um, you know, plotting for the grandbabies at 62. So it's 
it's really a whole different ball game. And I would have thought that I was just born with a body that was a lemon. And it turns out it's what you put in the body. It's not the body itself. And so, you know, I think that's a good news story for everybody. It absolutely is, Monique. And I just want to take one second to thank you personally for your assistance on my journey. The listeners know mine. I was vegetarian slash pescatarian for many, many years and then went vegan because at the time I thought I was doing better for my health, better for the planet, all the things. And then by the fifth year, sixth year, my health started to go off a cliff. And I was literally thinking like you were that I had inherited a lemon. I was fatigued. I was up like you constantly every hour on the hour during the night, waking pain throughout my body wondering what the heck was going on. The listeners know I came across a presentation by Sally online, Lost Seasonality, The Overconsumption of Plants. But I never have told this part of the story is that when I realized that plants could be actually defending themselves and have things that could harm us as opposed to what we've been taught than to eat all the greens that you want, I came across the Trying Low Oxalates group on Facebook and I joined. And you probably won't remember this, but you and I messaged probably about four years ago now, back and forth there. And you were so helpful to me. So I want to say thank you for that in person, because as someone that came into this completely blind and bowled over that I had been doing it all wrong, one of the things I've heard you say is that you are constantly helping folks who, who thought they were doing everything right, but still like me felt awful. Can you talk a little bit about that and what has happened and some of the diets that you've found that have been leading people into this lemon of a body feeling? Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's not just the vegans and the vegetarians, although I, too, at one point, would, you know, attempted to go vegetarian. And it's astonishing how quickly it can build up for some people, um, because I, I knew like maybe a couple of months into trying to eat a more vegetarian diet that it was not for me. I couldn't digest my food. We haven't talked about all the kinds of symptoms you can have, but you know, my anxiety spiked. There's all like it's not just the physiological stuff. There are there are physiological things I'd rather put up with than have an anxiety attack. Thank you very much. So, um, paleo diets are really bad, and any diet where you're being told eat as much spinach as possible, eat as much beet greens as possible, eat as much, you know, I. I doubled and tripled down on some of these things because I thought I was doing myself a favor. I mean, I got pregnant for my first as I was rounding the corner to 40. So I had them just after I was 40. And I wanted to be the healthiest mother possible. I cringe now at how much I was taking in. We were eating beets every week. We were eating beet greens every week. We were eating Swiss chard every week. We were eating spinach every week. We were, you know, when I start to list them all, we were eating almonds and snacks. Like it was just, it was the oxalate doomsday list it was definitely my dirty dozen that I've talked about on my on my blog and so you know was I taking in a couple of thousand milligrams a day I've never actually looked carefully at my diet from that time period because I suspect I'd scare myself but I've had you know clients come in on paleo particularly paleo um although if you're a vegan or a vegetarian you're going to be right up there as well where eating 2,000 or 3,000 milligrams of oxalate a day is not that hard to do. And the other one that that I think um, I need to highlight, and we can talk more about this, is things like vitamin C, where you're really getting oxalate from your supplements. And we, we totally underestimate how much that can actually be contributing to our diet because we don't realize simple things like about half of the vitamin C you take in degrades completely naturally and our bodies can normally handle it because it's a small amount, but half of it is clearly degrading to oxalate. So if you're taking in thousands of milligrams a day, I've got clients right now where I don't even have to touch their diet for the first six months. I'm just pulling them down in their vitamin C first. Monique, I will tell you that as a vegan, I and I will get into your, I love your oxalate dirty dozen list. And we'll talk about that. And then later on about the swaps, the substitutions that you can make, just changing the things you put on your plate and what a profound impact they can have. But I can tell you, and I'm not going to give away, and we've already talk, mentioned a few on your dirty dozen list, but I 
as I mentioned before we recorded today, that I calculated like you one day because I was just intrigued knowing what I was putting in my body on a daily basis. And at the very end, my last stages of veganism, when I was at my most sick, I was literally blending those things up, bags of spinach with kiwi fruit and turmeric root in there, not the extract, and chia nice. seeds all blended up and downing these things. And my gut was already compromised terribly. I had had bacterial infections, been on antibiotics for years. So I was the poster child for going down. But this segues nicely into my next question for you, because I don't want to get too far down the track for those that are going, yeah, but James and Monique, what are oxalates and plants and what do they do? And yeah. it explained to me so much when you talked about how plants use the oxalates to sequester minerals out of the soil and how I was constantly having leg cramps in the evening. And I, my minerals were depleted when I had a, a test done, all the ones that we need, magnesium, especially calcium. Please, Monique, I wonder if you could just do a, another sort of Reader's Digest version on what plants use oxalates for and how they can be dangerous to us. Oxalate is really a pretty simple chemical um, in terms of the compound itself. And plants are using it for a variety of things, but they have the metabolism, if you will, for that. They have the pathways to build it, to break it down. Um, so they are using it to draw minerals up into their the structure of the plant. So oxalate is biochemically a chelator. So it's going to find other minerals that are ideally suited to it. And unfortunately, lots of the big players for us, you know, your calcium, your magnesium, your zinc, like all of these double positive cations and oxalate is a double negative anion. And so those are matches made in heaven. And then oxalate can pull that mineral along with it. Well, in the human body, we don't have pathways that can break oxalate down. And so if we've got oxalate floating around inside the body, it's been absorbed from the gut and it's in the bloodstream, it's going to run into magnesium probably as our most prolific mineral in the bloodstream. And it's going to go, ooh, I love you. And, and then the kidneys, when the kidneys get that out of the bloodstream, magnesium goes with it, right? And it the problem there is how much we're taking in, because if a little bit of that was happening, our body would handle it fine. But if a lot of it's happening, and as a chelator, because it does love a lot of the minerals that are really key to our functioning, we can be low in calcium, you know, zinc, selenium, like just anything that's a double positive. But it doesn't just do that, because it can even mess with sodium and potassium it just takes two of them right so sodium is a single positive potassium is a single positive and it's a double negative so it'll take two molecules and so you can get things like sodium oxalate which are leaving the body and you know may, maybe that has something to do with why all these carnivores need all that salt to start out with like i don't even know right there's so many places where what I would suggest to you is we just don't have enough curiosity, I'd say, about what oxalate could be due, right? So so though in a plant, being able to pull up minerals into the plant structure, very useful, right? In a plant, it can then use things like oxalate crystals to actually increase its ability to do photosynthesis. <laughs> so, so those crystals can be helpful to a plant for the for purposes of generating energy, I mean, that's that's a big deal, right? But I think plants have accidentally perhaps stumbled into the fact that if they have a lot of these crystals in their leaves, that protects them from predation. In fact, something like spinach, where you've got a lot of oxalate as a crystal, it actually breaks the mouths of the insects that try to predate it. So it's you know, it's really become uh, one of those things that's traveling under the radar because we don't pay attention to the anti-nutrients in plants. We only pay attention to the nutrients. And as a net result, instead of there being some kind of a cost benefit where we're looking at, okay, this plant's got lots of good things in it. Um, and it's really low in toxin. And so that's a good plant for us, right? We go, oh, look at all the iron in spinach. 
mostly bound to oxalate. Sure, this is great for you. If you're an if you have iron anemia, eat this. Whereas iron's another double positive cation in your body. And so you might actually be depleting iron by eating spinach. Like we we just don't, we don't know enough about what oxalate can be doing in a human body at sublethal levels, I would argue, right? We understand oxalate poisoning when it's acute and it's big and, you know, people are coming into the ER and they're in real distress. But what's happening with small amounts over long time periods? And how is that affecting the body? And I don't think, I don't think anybody would argue that, quote unquote, a mild toxin is not still a toxin and yet you know so nobody would say to you oh you've you've gotten all the arsenic out of your body that's really good now you can have a little bit again nobody would say that but yeah we say that about oxalate I don't know so I'm sorry I, I wandered a little bit away from what plants are doing but they really have a robust um multiple sets of usage for this in their biochemistry but we don't, we do not have the metabolic pathways to break it down. And we've always, as a species, in all likelihood, depended on our guts to be able to break it down. And so we've got a perfect storm there with other kinds of impacts to the gut from um, things like antibiotics or things like the diet composition, which may affect what kind of bacteria you have in the gut and then how effective you are at being able to break any of that oxalate down. Really, really excellent, Monique. I really appreciate your perspective on that because again, as I look back on my journey and I mentioned to you, I I, I took handfuls of ciproflaxin for years because I was in constant pain. And thanks again to you because realizing that I had thought that gluten was an issue for me for so long that I went on a gluten-free diet even when I was vegetarian early on. And you know, a lot of those gluten-free products are filled with nut flours. And all kinds of all kinds of highly oxalate toxic things. But it eventually led to me not being able to handle any amount. And I'm sure the little for those folks that don't know, there is an oxalate degrading bacteria called oxalobacter formigenes that many can expand on much better than I can. But once it's gone, it's gone. It's very difficult to take a supplement that you can put uh, from what I understand to replenish your amount of that. Isn't that right, Monique? And it really speaks to how with the advent of ad antibiotics, which saved lives, but also impacted so many folks' gut and digestive capabilities. What does the body do or how does the body now sequester these oxalates, Monique? Old injury sites, tissues, things like that, I understand? There does look to be some kind of it's not so much it's being sequestered there as it's almost like it's attracted to sites of inflammation in the body. So this is not something I think there's been a bunch of research on, but certainly on the trying low oxalate support groups. Um, there's a lot of reports of, gee, I've been doing the diet for a while and all of a sudden this old tennis elbow is acting up or, you know, I had had falls doing figure skating and other sports when I was a kid and, and I'd really knocked my tailbone. And at one point I remember waking up in the morning with my tailbone aching and going, what the heck is that? <laughs> like, so, so it can end up um, through whatever mechanism being trafficked into these places where we've had an injury. And then as the injury heals, you may have oxalate that's kind of being stored in those tissues. A, a lot of what I know now about how oxalate is trafficked into tissues has to do with um, some of the information that Susan Owens, who's the original founder of the Triangle Oxalate Support Group, um, has posted on that group. And that includes things like you know, certain cell transporters, which move chloride, which move sulfite, which move bicarbonate. Some of these cell transporters also move oxalate. And so you can also get almost like a case of mistaken identity where your cell transporter goes out into the fluid around the cell to pick up a nutrient that it needs. 
and let's say it's sulfate just because that's one of the more common ones where where oxalate gets mistakenly picked up and th that would be where you've got a cell transporter that moves both so it get it picks up sulfate but it's supposed to move oxalate out of the cell because our bodies do know about oxalate it's a metabolic endpoint so cell transporters are used to get oxalate out of the cell. However, if your cell transporter is out there looking for sulfate, but it meets up with an oxalate molecule and that fits the ending, that cell transporter is not smart enough. It developed in an environment where oxalate came from inside the cell and what came from outside the cell was the nutrient. And we've we've kind of put that on its head when we take a lot of oxalate in because then all of a sudden you have oxalate plentiful in the interstitial fluid around the cell and you've got these cell transporters who are going out to look for a nutrient and they're pulling oxalate into the cell. Now it takes energy for a cell to run a cell transporter. So then maybe the cell can't do what it was going to do to generate energy and it has to kind of build up energy again before it could do another pull. But what if the next pull is oxalate too? And the next one, and the next one, right? You can actually end up with a situation where it's accumulating in the tissue because every time cell transporter goes out looking for sulfate, instead of finding sulfate, it's finding oxalate. I think the research is starting to point in the direction of things like that because there's research now on arthritis and that there may be oxalate accumulating in joints. There's research in the area of oxalosis, which shows that oxalate may be preferentially turning up in like lots of places in the body, bones, um, blood vessels, eyes, like, and what we're seeing on the triangle oxalate groups is that people report those kinds of symptoms long before the kidneys are damaged. So what if it's the oxalate building up in the body that's causing the kidneys to be damaged as opposed to, oh, the kidneys are damaged and now oxalate's building up in the body. And we just don't see enough, I'd say, curiosity there about that. And honestly, once oxalate um, starts to drive inflammation, and there is research on that that shows um, that oxalate can kick off the inflammasome at the cellular level. So once oxalates kicked off inflammation, all of the, the kinds of things the body does to deal with inflammation, we may have things going on there which are taking oxalate into places we don't want it to be, but not the least of which could be how we mess with our neurotransmitters. And this is not something that I think there's any research on, but the more I read on how the body handles inflammation, the body's response to inflammation is to treat it as if it's acute, but oxalate inflammation is chronic. So in cases of acute inflammation, what the, what the nervous system does is pull down serotonin, pull down dopamine. If you're doing that constantly, are you setting up you know, the conditions for anxiety? Are you setting up the conditions for poor sleep? Are you setting up the conditions for all kinds of things? Although, I think we just need some curiosity about some of these things and also need to look at some of the ways that normal human metabolism would affect oxalate trafficking. Because we do know that neurotransmitters affect how oxalate gets trafficked, hormones affect how oxalate gets trafficked, cytokines affect how oxalate gets trafficked. And now we are seeing um, research that shows that histamine affects how oxalate gets trafficked. And salicylate affects how oxalate gets trafficked. And is that in? Is that out? Where is it going? Like we just have it, it. The more I look at it, the more I think we've got a toxin which turns our health environment into a three ring circus where we don't know whether the lions, the tigers, or the bears are loose, but something's wrong. Again, thank you for your wisdom in this area. You know, listening to you and listening to your presentations and all that you put out there, understanding that oxalates can affect us from a mitochondrial level yeah. really hit home for me. And I realized, and looking back, that the moment that I decided that, because I didn't go full carnivore right away, and we're going to talk about what happens and what happened to me when I did that and eliminated everything all at once and how dangerous it can be. 
when I started to, to lower my oxalate intake, what I did was, and we're going to talk about now your oxalate uh, dirty dozen, I swapped thanks to your lists, some of the foods over that I was eating. And I noticed, you know, high anxiety, that, that fight or flight symptom started to come down. My thyroid was swinging, going back from hypo to hyper. And we know oxalate accumulates in the thyroid. Again, all the classic signs. So again, thank you for all that you do. Now that folks have heard about oxalates and how plants use them and what they are, and they're thinking to themselves, okay, what are these foods? We heard a couple at the beginning, but you have this dirty dozen list that I think is a really good one. Can you run that off? And then we'll talk about afterwards when people realize, oh no, that's me. <laughs> and then we'll talk about the um, symptoms that can be associated with oxalate toxicity. So, you know, I came up with this oxalate dirty dozen thing because you know, the environmental working group has their dirty dozen for, for foods that are having too much pesticide in them. And I thought, oh, we need one too. I really looked at a combination of factors, not the least of which was what things are really becoming more plentiful in our diet. So if I were to do a new version of the dirty dozen, which I keep thinking I'm, I'm going to do, I would change some of the things that are on here. But my number one re would probably remain almonds everybody eats almonds and um you know it's astonishing to me how much oxalate is actually in almonds like if if you're eating a quarter cup like an ounce basically of almonds that's 140 milligrams of oxalate and who eats an ounce like <laughs> you're probably eating you know a half a cup or more right and, and they come in all these ways, which increase the amount of oxalate there, like coated in dark chocolate. We'll get to chocolate anyway, but almonds would definitely remain my number one in the years since I, the, like it's been a few years, I think, since I did that list, there's been a new nut, which has hit the market called the Baru nut. It's also under the brand name Baruka. And that particular nut has a couple of milligrams of oxalate for the same ounce. So, you know, there's, there's a big difference between a quarter cup of one and a quarter cup of the other. But the, the scary thing in my mind, in terms of how much oxalate is present with almond is things like the uh, gluten-free alternative muffins, if they're using something like almond flour, because a quarter cup of almond flour you have less air basically than you do in a quarter cup of all whole almonds. So in a quarter cup of the flour, you're looking at more like 300 milligrams of oxalate. And so it's, and it's easy to have that much in one of those big muffins, right? So yeah, definitely I would move away from almonds uh, and they will always be at the top of my dirty dozen list. And the next one has got to be spinach. Again, it's just, ubiquitous there are so many people eating handfuls of spinach in salads or even more detrimental in my mind throwing them into smoothies and grinding them up and then like being able to consume and possibly absorb even more of it and it, like it's a great place where you can go to a really simple substitution where uh you just put in greens that are a lot lower in oxalate and my favorite's arugula. So while arugula though, for some people is a bit spicy when it's raw. So yeah, then you can go to a, like a purple kale or something like that. A fraction, again, a fraction of the oxalate because spinach is another really heavy hitter where you've got per gram of spinach. I think you've got something like, um, 10 milligrams of oxalate per gram of spinach leaves. Um, and then, of course, dark chocolate. Nobody loves me for this one. <laughs> 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 and so, of course, take something really high oxalate like almonds, then put dark chocolate on them. It's even better, right? Uh, dark chocolate's another one where it's a really heavy hitter in terms of oxalate. Um, that was a very sad one for me. But yeah, some of these things are about serving size. So if you have like a, we'll go and get like something that has like a caramel or cream center and then has a little thin layer of like milk chocolate around the outside. You, 
you know, some of this you can manage with how much of it you take in, but yeah, I wouldn't eat dark chocolate for anything anymore. It's just way too high. Turmeric, golden milk, uh, it just appalls me. <laughs> Turmeric root is so high. Like I think one, is it one tablespoon? I should check myself. You know, no, one teaspoon of turmeric spice is about 50 milligrams of oxalate. And of course, you put at least a teaspoon in this golden milk stuff that people are drinking. And so, you know, all of a sudden, just that alone is 100 milligrams of oxalate a day. And just to put that in perspective, if you go to places like Mayo Clinic or, or some of these other um, big medical schools where they have a kidney health section or they talk about kidney stones, most of them will recommend that you take in about 50 milligrams a day total if you want to avoid kidney stones. So if you're talking about 100 milligrams, it's just your golden milk and we haven't even added in your almonds and your spinach and your... Oh, and we haven't we haven't even hit the highest hitters yet. I, they weren't at the top, but they're another good one are beets and beet greens. Again, so many people uh, think these are really healthy, and uh, they're also not quite as bad as spinach, but pretty darn close. And now they're juicing them, and so I looked into how much oxalate there is in beet juice. And one cup of beet juice is just over a hundred milligrams. So again, we're at that, that hundred milligram level without too much difficulty. That said, it's not number one, but it's the highest oxalate thing we still call food. And that's rhubarb. And when I was a kid, everybody had a rhubarb plant in their backyard and everyone would harvest it in the spring, but all the kids knew you never you never chewed on a leaf. You avoided the leaves. So we actually know that the leaves are toxic and there we are eating the stems. <laughs> and it really, this one really makes, makes spinach, although spinach is number one or number two and almonds are number one. Rhubarb is for a half cup of rhubarb that's been stewed. It's about 750 milligrams of oxalate. That's more oxalate than we should be taking in in over a week. So <laughs> that's, that's pretty bad as well. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Minnie, but go ahead. The, the yeah, listeners go ahead. have to understand, and I'll, I'll let you understand. So I'm reliving this now on what I used to eat on a daily basis because where I live in Bermuda, the island of Bermuda, we have very fertile soil for certain things, and certain things grow well here. We're a subtropical island. So beets and beet greens, I ate them constantly, they, and they grow very well here. Swiss chard, which we haven't got to yet, but I was, chard grows very well here. Spinach, I was putting all these things. So I would be having this smoothie in the morning um, and we haven't gotten to the fruits yet, but all the fruits packed in there. And then in the evenings, I would be having that golden milk because it was supposed to be anti-inflammatory and help you sleep. Yeah. So my, my body was going to bed ingesting a ton more of raw turmeric. I was using the raw spice. See, this is the thing. It's what people don't recognize is that with very simple, easy to get foods, you can be taking in thousands of milligrams of oxalate a day. It's not difficult to do, right? Um, we were here eating almonds, Swiss chard, beets and beet greens, spinach, something from there was on our diet every single day. And, um, and almonds all the time, right? It just dark chocolate because that was supposed to be good for you. Like, yeah, it's not, it's not difficult to be in this boat. All right. So my, my number seven is Tef. And this was really because there's so much attention now to being gluten-free and I actually think that's good attention. I do think we should be looking at whether or not gluten is causing some low grade inflammation in the gut. Um, and for enough of us that it might be worthwhile considering, especially if you've got gut issues. But the problem with TEF is you're replacing gluten with something where um, you've got an, another incredibly high oxalate alternative, not as bad as almond flour, but a half cup of the flour is going to come in between about 130 and 150 milligrams. So again, you can 
you could end up with a lot of oxalate in the baked good that you make from it. And actually wheat flour, even if you use whole wheat flour has only 40 milligrams of oxalate per half a cup and white wheat flour is only 15. And so you swap those out for something like Teff where it's 10 times as much uh, over the white flour and it's crazy. And of course, Swiss chard. Swiss chard is also very high oxalate. Um, but a half cup of loosely packed Swiss chard is about 170 milligrams of oxalate as opposed to the 300 or so for spinach. So <laughs> bad, but not as bad as spinach, but still wouldn't be on my eat ever list. Number nine is sweet potato, which has also become the darling of low carb diets. And so, and of course, all these people swapping regular potatoes for sweet potatoes, they're in fact upping their oxalate. So the sweet potatoes got more, generally more oxalate than a white potato. So yeah. another one of those, uh, if you're having about a, like if you're eating one whole sweet potato, you could be at a couple of hundred milligrams of oxalate. It's not, it's not difficult. Um, black beans. I threw that one in because of everybody loves Mexican food and black beans are a big one there. Uh, half cup, 70 milligrams of oxalate. So compared to some of these other ones, an amateur, but who eats only a half cup of a Mexican dish with black beans in it, right? So, <laughs> so I, I included it because, you know, you, again, you've got great options there. So you don't have to be eating that particular legume. There are other legumes. Um, another real favorite, not just for, um, you know, low carb, but use there and not just for those who want to like balance their blood sugar, but use there is cinnamon. Every teaspoon of cinnamon um, is going to get you about 40 milligrams of oxalate. And the real reason I included this one was because they had that cinnamon challenge that kids were taking for a while there. I saw that. That's crazy. And people were ending up poisoned on it. And I suspect it was not just that they couldn't get it down or they would cough or they would sneeze and it would end up in their lungs, but there's all this oxalate in, in ground cinnamon as well. So yeah, crazy, crazy thing. And uh, my last but not least is the ever famous in the US russet potato that everybody loves. And it, you know, while it's less than the sweet potato in terms of oxalate, um, a single russet potato is generally going to come in maybe about 120 milligrams of oxalate. So, you know, it, it's not just any single thing in your diet that's creating the problem. It's the synergy between all these things as they're all adding more oxalate to your diet. And that the dirty dozen is just the heaviest hitters or most common things in the diet. It's not everything that's adding oxalate to your diet either. That list, again, just reminds me of everything, especially the sweet potatoes. Boy, did I eat a lot of those too many. Every day, sometimes they came up, this brand came up with this bag where you could buy frozen sweet potato slices, stick them in your toaster, and you could have them. And I was using those as bread in the morning with nut butter on top. See, that's oh. the thing. If you're, if you're having the morning smoothie, and I... Like the fruits are not as bad as like, there was nothing in the fruit category that's as bad as the things that I've listed there in the vegetable category. But let's say you're using star fruit. Star fruit's known for people to end up with poisoning from it. So if your smoothie's got spinach and I've seen the star fruit, um, you're adding raw turmeric, you're adding raw cocoa, you're adding, I'm like a stunt and then, almond butter for your protein right it's just it's that cumulative thing and i honestly think that part of the reason why so many of us have leaky gut or inflamed gut could have a lot to do with oxalate in its microcrystalline form in some of these foods like if you think about it something like spinach in particular because it's even got kind of a gritty texture to it right that's basically sandpaper running through your gut. Like, you know, I've had people say to me, oh, once I get the oxalate 
down and I, my, you know, my, my gut's healed, then I'll be able to tolerate oxalate again. What if oxalate's what put you in this mess in the first place? Why would you want to put it back? Thank you very much. And before we move on to the next uh, subject, which we talked about, which is some symptoms that folks that may th- now hearing what they've just heard go, oh boy, I've been eating a ton of these. And we'll talk about some of the potential symptoms of oxalate toxicity. I know we've hit on a few, but I just want to touch on a few of the food groups, Monique, but, um, with your expertise in the area, because there's always a lot of questions about this. In general, nuts are bad, correct? There are a few that are lower, like I think you said macadamia and maybe walnut. Is that right? Macadamias, walnuts. Um, yeah, you could have a, a little bit of maybe even a pistach- pistachios or pecans, but your best bet's really this baru nut. But that said, you've probably got, um, you know, say 15 milligrams of oxalate in that handful of macadamia nuts versus, you know, 150 to 200 in that handful of oxalate. So you're one tenth. So yeah, yeah, there are definitely ways to sort of sub um, and have something in your diet, just using a different food. How about, um, let's just look at the grains and pseudo grains. You mentioned teff, which again, I was experiencing. I didn't eat a lot of it, but we were trying new ones at the time, but quinoa for sure. And I think you've mentioned buckwheat being very high too. And I, I ate a lot of that because as a vegan, you're trying to fill yourself because you're constantly hungry because the greens aren't filling you. So you're looking for some sort of grain product. What are some good alternatives for folks in that grain area? And I would argue too, that one of the reasons why you're so hungry as a vegan or a vegetarian is because there's not enough nutrient in it. So, um, but that said, if you know, if you're relatively healthy and you like grains, then I would go to, you know, rice is probably better for you. It's one of the lower ones. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of chatter about corn. I'm not sure how great corn is for you, but it's low oxalate. So, you know, if you don't have other gut issues, it might be all right. I've actually started to move towards grain, uh, non-grain flours if I'm going to make baked goods. So sometimes lupin, sometimes coconut flour. Like, so it's, you know, I'm kind of thinking when it comes to grains that I want things as nutrient dense as possible. And a lot of the grains are just really heavy in starch. But one of the ones that I do really like is fonio, F-O-N-I-O. It's it's relatively new in the North American market. It can be very hard to find. For a while there, it was it was really popular around here, and then it just sort of disappeared. It was a bit faddish. But um, what I like about it is it has a lot stronger taste. My kids really liked it. I don't I don't really eat grains. I tasted a little bit to figure out what they were what they were telling me. Um, but it has almost a nutty flavor, so it's a nice it's a nice option for somebody who wants a grain which has some flavor of its own because white rice doesn't have a lot of flavor of its own. If people are not celiac um, and they're out somewhere, I would actually recommend them like a white flour bun if they wanted to have a bread product over almost any of the fancy, healthier, you know, whole grain, blah, blah, blahs. And last two on the diet, then we'll move on to the others that, that I, I often get questions about are coffees, decaf and regular, and then teas. I know black tea tends to be very high, but if someone's going to want tea, are the recommendations for tea drinkers that they could use? If you really want like actual tea, as opposed to a herbal kind of thing, I would look at like a decaffeinated green that seems to be a bit lower than some of the others. And decaffeinated probably in general is a bit lower than, um, you know, your regular conventional black tea. We did test, trying to think of which black tea it was. There was one that wasn't too bad, Um, but like it's really hard unless foods have been tested and you know where they're coming from and what, you know, growing conditions can all make a difference. So in general, if I was going to opt for some kind of tea, I would either opt for herbal or I would opt for decaf regular. And the herbal ones, you still have to dodge a few bullets, but rooibos, which people like, is a good one. Um, chamomile, peppermint, nettle, 
Uh, I drink all of those. I like horsetail tea. It's higher in minerals, um, but it's a diuretic. So people have to kind of figure out what, what they need to be doing with that. But yeah, there's, there's some really good herbal ones. So those would be worth checking out. And the nice thing about something like tea is you can carry a few tea bags with you. All right. So folks have now heard about some of their favorite stuff, the dark chocolate, especially, and they're going, oh man, I've eaten a ton of this. And they're thinking to themselves, I've had some aches and pains that I have not figured out what is going on. What are some of the typical symptoms that when you someone comes to you, Monique, and they say, well, I've got this and this and this, and you're starting to think, yep, this is looking like oxalate toxicity or something to do with oxalates. To some extent, I'm suspicious anytime somebody has gut issues, only because from the mouth right through the gut is ground zero. That's the first you know, part of your body that's going to be exposed to oxalate. And there are some kinds of like issues with uh, teeth and gum soreness and stuff where barring something else more obvious, I might assume that there could be oxalate involved there. But there are some really distinctive kinds of places where it is too. So old injury sites, that's if somebody says to me, I don't know why, you know, this I broke my ankle 35 years ago and it's bothering me, you know, and, and they haven't done anything for it to be bothering them. I would, I would definitely think oxalate. If they're talking about um, like having a lot of eye irritation or eye pain, or even like little crystals around the eyes, the eyes are one of the places where for some reason oxalate gets marooned. And so when people talk to me about eye issues, um, I will think oxalate. I do think oxalate when it comes to migraine, because there's also a certain amount of issue with electrolytes, which can set off migraine. And part of the reason why I think of that is that I personally had migraines with aura for decades and now I don't have that. And so, yeah. Wow. I'm sorry. Again, it, you just took me right back when again, that I realized that I was constantly going to my doctor saying I had migraines with auras coming on all the time as a vegan and I couldn't figure it out. And I just realized I don't have them anymore. Sorry yeah. again. I'm just having these aha moments with you. Yeah. So you, we, you mentioned something about the thyroid. The thyroid is a place where for whatever reason, um, oxalate pools there. And as I've learned more about how the thyroid functions, it could have to do with chloride transporters which are plentiful in the thyroid and those chloride transporters may move oxalate um and this is one where i accidentally ran into an easy support for the thyroid which is magnesium chloride oil that stuff they call magnesium oil one day i was getting out of the shower i was using it to get more magnesium into my body and um you know my gut was in terrible shape so i was trying to avoid having to take everything orally so here i was putting this magnesium chloride oil on my on my skin and i got to the end and i had i still had some left on my hands and i remember kind of going and then just sort of throwing it here because i was trying to get it off my hands so i could go get dressed and get my day going and uh my doctor had just started me on thyroid meds again long story short i had to come off the thyroid meds and the next time I went to my endocrine guy, he says, your numbers are better than they've been in ages. So I guess we got the medication right. And I looked at him and I said, I'm not taking it. And he's like, a a pardon. <laughs> <laughs> and so I told him about this, putting this magnesium chloride on my throat. And it seemed to be, I seemed to be able to get out in front of the, the symptoms because I was doing the same thing, too hot, too cold, too hot, too cold, too hot, too cold. And I would have this time period in the afternoon where I'd always be too cold. And I managed to get out in front of that and use the magnesium oil a couple of times in the in the morning. And I wouldn't have this low period where I was too cold in the afternoon. And he said, well, I don't know why it's working, but keep doing it. And so I've never had to be on thyroid meds, even though all the indicators were there. So that's another one where I would, if somebody says that their thyroid's not right, like why would everybody have a bad thyroid nowadays? Like, almost everybody. If you have any kind of arthritis where it's not following a pattern. So the research says that if you've got 
atypical arthritis. So it sort of looks like rheumatoid, but it doesn't function the way it should. Or it sort of looks like psoriatic, but it doesn't function the way it should. And interestingly enough, I was diagnosed in my 20s with possible rheumatoid arthritis. And they told me I'd be in a wheelchair by the time I was 30. And that was the first time I changed my diet. I did not completely work out the oxalate thing, but I took it down enough that I dodged that particular one. But that's another place where if you've got that kind of stuff going on, I would definitely look at oxalate. Um, and a heads up to people who um, you know, are worried about breast health, because there is research that says oxalate microcalcifications could be part of what triggers breast cancer. And I have an unusual number of women in my client base who have either had some kind of growth removed or have had cysts or have had something else going on in their breasts or have actually dealt with breast cancer. And this is one of those ones that concerns me greatly because when women get breast cancer, they are most likely going to be recommended a plant-based diet. And if their cancer was actually triggered because of microcalcifications caused by oxalate, it, we are giving them exactly the wrong advice. Thank you for that, Monique. That is, yeah, that I just think about all the symptoms that I had and, you know, how congruent they are with what you're describing, especially the arthritic. There was a point where I was having, they thought it was carpal tunnel syndrome. I was having to wear braces on my wrists at work because my wrist, and I'd never had that happen before, but it was on the high oxalate diet. So folks now have understood the foods that may be potentially harming them. They've understood that the symptoms that may be associated with those foods I should mention. Sure. I should mention pain syndromes often seem to be related to oxalate as well. And things like poor immune resilience or poor exercise resilience, just so that people understand it's not a single system. It's not a single place in the body that can be affected. And any inflammatory condition where there doesn't seem to be a reason for the inflammation to be driven, I think you have to be looking for something under the hood, as you, as I would call it, because the diet can be very much ignored by a lot of our conventional approaches to, to health issues. One of the things I've heard you talk about, and again, thank you for your dedication and, and all in this area, because you put things in a way that people that have oxalate toxicity can understand easily. And you you talk about there being no downside to lowering your oxalate intake. <laughs> there just isn't any. So folks are probably thinking, well, is there a test for this? And, and you've also said that tests really, especially the urinary tests are like a snapshot in time, so they may not be accurate. Are there any tests you can re recommend that may give you a glimpse that yes, you have an oxalate toxicity problem? Some simple tests that might be helpful are things like a 24 hour urine oxalate. If you're putting a lot of oxalate out into the urine, but you don't have any kidney stones or anything like that, that may give you at least something to have a discussion with your doctor about. The problem is whether or not your doctor will order it if you don't have kidney stones. So um, I managed to talk my GP into that. Um, I actually know him from before he was a GP. And so I had, I had kind of a, a friendship basis to be able to say, just can we perform an experiment here? <laughs> anyway. Um, but when I got my daily urine um, examined, the first test I did showed me at 293 milligrams of oxalate for, in my daily urine. And the Mayo Clinic will tell you at over 45 milligrams of oxalate in your daily urine, you could be diagnosed as hyperoxaluria. And um, so, yes, I got my doctor's attention by getting that test. Now, if it's a day when, for whatever reason, you weren't putting out as much oxalate, because there does seem to be kind of a, a an ebb and flow to how much um, may be in our urine, it may not show you what you'd like to see. But that's certainly a place where you can start. And it's a fairly simple test and it doesn't cost a lot of money. You can go to like an organic acids test and that's going to cost you a lot more money and it's still a snapshot. And so the problem is what if when you get your results, it looks like there's not a lot of oxalate um, in the test. It That's really a tough one. 
And that's really why I say there's no, there's no real downside to trying the diet. We're, you don't have to remove food groups from your diet, although you may want. You can just do substitutions, spinach, arugula, you know, almonds, baru nuts. It's not that hard to, to bring your oxalate down and then see what happens, right? Yeah. So now from understanding that if you go too hard, too fast, there is a real danger. And this is what happened to me because, again, thank you for the way you describe things. Because when you're getting rid of oxalate and when oxalate comes in, it's a problem, but it's just as much of a problem when it leaves the body. Um, it's also almost as if you describe it as if you're dealing with heavy metals. That's about the closest thing. And if you go too hard, too fast, it can be very, very dangerous. So how and what is your best advice for folks that want to approach this way of eating and, and lower their oxalate intake? Let's put it in some context too. So if I was eating a really high oxalate diet in my 20s, but I haven't gotten really sick until my 30s, I'm also in a different position health-wise when I'm trying to get rid of it than when it was going in, right? So although oxalate's toxic, you know, whenever you're consuming it or whenever it's coming into your system, the problem is what's your health status at the time when you're trying to get it out. For most of us, our health status will be compromised in some way. So we definitely want to go slowly. So for most people, what I'd say is you want to come down a little bit at a time. For some people, that's difficult. What I've started to recommend for clients who want to stay omnivores is, okay, let's get you kind of a baseline diet that you will eventually be able to just stay on. And let's have add-ins, oxalate add-ins that are going to take you up, maybe very down a little bit and then up and then down. Because what we want to do is let the body get rid of some of the oxalate, but not let the body settle into, oh, we're eating low oxalate all the time. So now I can just get rid of this stuff as fast as I want to, right? No, you don't want to do that. It's the same. It, that is very similar to chelating heavy metals. Yes, you've got heavy metals in your body. You don't want to get rid of them all at once. They are just as toxic on the way out as they were on the way in. But the bigger problem is, and you're not as healthy on the way out as you were when they went in. So, so by, by having an oxalate sort of wave approach where some days I've got a bit higher oxalate, some days I'm going to be right down in the low category. And then I'm back up in a, a higher oxalate category and then low again is that your body can't decide, oh, we've hit homeostasis. I just I can do the same thing every day. I can get rid of lots of oxalate every day. Your body has to pay attention. Oh, look, there's that. That's in the gut. So I have to stop. Oh, I can get rid of some. It's down. Oh, no, I can't do overdo it because we're back up again. So it just forces the body to stay flexible in its approach to what it's doing with oxalate. Because our bodies are like us. If we're doing something every day, it becomes kind of a background process and we just do it. What we want is not to have a kind of over focus of the body on getting rid of oxalate. We want to keep it sort of getting rid of some, then stopping, getting rid of some, then stopping. And that wave approach can really help. So uh, I'll often say to people, here's the kinds of stuff that you could eat to eat kind of a medium oxalate diet. And here's your add-ins. On day one, I want you to add about 200 milligrams of oxalate. And on day two, maybe you add 100 milligrams of oxalate. And on day three, maybe you add 50 milligrams of oxalate. And then we're going to we're gonna claw out the add-ins. So if your baseline diet looks like between 60 and maybe 100 milligrams of oxalate a day, which is where I would let people go to first, because not everybody has to be sort of perfectly low oxalate. But some people can do fine in that medium range and then have them have add-ins, right? Then they're also not getting rid of all their favorite foods all at once necessarily, because maybe I'm having sweet potato a couple of days a week, or maybe I'm having um, green beans, which are not that terrible, but are maybe about 50 extra milligrams of oxalate, depending on how much you're eating of them. So maybe I'm having that a couple of times a week. And I've got lists that are 
you know, sort of combinations of things that are going to get you at that 200 level, things that will get you at about a 100 level, things that will get you at about a 50 level. And then even smaller doses of other things that would get you lower than that. So we can kind of slowly pull things out. Um, but the, the biggest thing is having, while you're doing this, building some tools to help you moderate both oxalate dumping and the kinds of si symptoms you can get. Because as that pro-inflammatory stuff is moving, that's what it's going to do. It's going to drive inflammation. And so you need to, you need to be able to respond to that. And it's going to increase your needs for certain kinds of nutrients because of the kind of work that your body's doing as it's coping with oxalate and what oxalate's doing as it's leaving. It's such a nuanced way of doing things that I'm so grateful for folks like you that are able to coach this because you can imagine, and I know, and I've listened to countless of your podcasts, Monique, and even still, you know, you just have to be, you have to be so aware because it can be dangerous. And I found out the hard way. I went cold Turkey on every piece of oxalate, because as I said earlier, I was like, right, they're out. They caused me all this harm. I'm dishing everything and I'm just going to eat animal products. And this is the way to go. And I found out the hard way about a couple of weeks in, oh boy, did my body go, hooray, here we go, boom. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. I feel terrible. My back, my kidneys started to ache, everything. It was not good. This is what concerns me most with carnivores is that I think a carnivore diet can be an incredibly helpful diet. I am now mostly carnivore. I, If I ate 10 milligrams of oxalate in a day, it's a big day. Like I just don't, and the reason for that is that my body kept saying, the lower I went in oxalate, the more my body went, oh yeah, that's good. Oh yeah, that's good. Oh yeah, that's good. But first I had spent two or three years kind of bringing it down. And uh, fortunately I tried to nosedive, but I made enough mistakes that we didn't, we didn't quite make the full nosedive. And th that's, that was our saving grace. But in hindsight, now I would know, yeah, I want to keep some oxalate in. I want to do this kind of carefully. And I want to work with what my body needs in order to handle inflammation and the kinds of symptoms that I'm getting. And I also want to definitely take a more nuanced approach than the nosedive. As soon as I knew oxalate was doing what it was doing to us, I just wanted it out of my diet. I think most people do. But it really does require that you kind of it's like sailing. You're going to have to tack towards your goal. You can't just go straight to it because you have, you have the environment, you have your symptoms, you have the, you know, what's going on around you, your stressors, like all these things are going to make a difference in how fast and how well you handle the oxalate leaving your body. And it's really about handling it well, because there's no award for getting to the finish line first. So true. I, I love your analogies. And the race is not for the swift, but those who can endure it, as they say, because you do not want to go fast. You want to endure this to be alive because it can be so dangerous and potentially very harmful if you do too fast, too quickly. Monique, I'm so conscious of the time, but there's a few more things I want to touch on because we're going to have to have you back for part two. This is just too exciting for me. You can tell I'm like a kid on Christmas morning <laughs> talking Oxley here with you. I'm like, woo. <laughs> but, but a couple of more things, and I want to touch on what I get a lot of questions on, and you're so good at this. In fact, I would really say you're one of the premier experts in this area, and, and that is the instance of those folks that are suffering with mast cell activation, histamine response due to oxalate. I get a ton of questions. There's so many poor folks out there that are suffering with histamine and mast cell activation. How do you help these folks out? Please let us know. And this is one of those places where I think we have to keep in mind what oxalate is doing when it's kicking off things like the inflammasome in the system. There is some indication, both because it messes with mitochondrial function and, and you know, drives inflammation and all these bits and pieces, which do sort of point towards mast cell. It's possible that oxalate's a mast cell irritant it's also possible that it makes the mast cell more likely to release things like histamines. And it does look like histamine affects how oxalate gets trafficked. And so there is some kind of overlap there where um, like some of the symptoms that people report with oxalate dumping look like they're more related to 
what oxalate might have done to mast cells and then to histamine release as opposed to what oxalate's doing itself directly. So there's these indirect effects. And when people do have this histamine issue or a mast cell issue, then the approach is a little bit different because you have to go gentler. You have to go more carefully. Um, you want to take the pressure off the body by lowering histamine load. And, you know, from my standpoint, supplements become even more important because your body's doing a lot of work there. You want to hopefully avoid some development of histamine with supplements. You want to help the body break histamine down. That can mean things like methyl groups. And the challenge there is that people may have told methylation is bad for them or things like that. So it's, you know, I do think though, that if you can get oxalate out of the way that things like mast cell um, and or histamine intolerance do get better because that's certainly what I've seen myself, but it becomes again, sort of a more nuanced kind of approach once you've got these other kinds of things going on. So then it's not just straight ahead, just deal with oxalate. Um, it's, it's we have to like protect the body's resilience. We have to protect the body's functioning, your energy level, your ability to handle your day and, and take the pressure off wherever we can. So that your body doesn't have to do unnecessary work even to do things like get nutrients, right? So I'll be with people like that really doubling down on things like nutrient density. Every bite's got to count because I don't want your body having to do extra work just to get nutrients out of your food, right? So it, there can be a lot of bits and pieces there. Um, depends a lot on what kind of diet people want to have over the longer haul, what kinds of supplements their body deals with well, and some of that may be where they are in the process. So that is a more difficult journey than somebody who maybe just has a, a relatively uncomplicated oxalate problem, which maybe they were lucky enough to find earlier. But most of us who get really sick have got some level of histamine or mast cell. And what I'd say is you can come to the other side of that because I think the anxiety as a symptom and some of that really might be the histamine and mast cell aspect, the sleep disturbance where you, where you're, where you're not able to sleep. I think that's histamine in the brain and that cycle not being, not being properly managed anymore by the body. But at this point in time, you know, I'm essentially as, as good as I had hoped I would be. And sleep well, don't have problems, as long as I'm not messing with this stuff, right? I just have to stay away from it. That segues nicely into the last little bit that I want to talk about on today's uh, discussion, and that is supplements that can help with the low oxalate diet, i.e. augment it and things you can take to supplement as you detox from oxalates and potential things that you may be supplementing with that are harmful. And I'm thinking the current craze of high dose vitamin C, as we alluded to earlier, what are yeah. the things you can help take that will help and those that will hinder? I really think one of the things I accidentally did well 15 years ago, I'm almost 63. So I was 48. So yeah, was take minerals. Do whatever you can to support your mineral levels because as oxalates leaving your body, it's going to be chelating minerals. So anything you can do to support your key mineral levels, big ticket guy for most of us is magnesium. Uh, I, I almost don't see a person who doesn't benefit by getting more magnesium into their system, but could also be some calcium, zinc, selenium, things like molybdenum that can help with um, detox and sulfation. Like, so your trace minerals are not necessarily ones that you can ignore um, because they can be, they can be chelated too. So, but the thing about taking minerals is that for most of us, that's a pretty gentle way to start. And all we're doing is providing nutrients. So at that point, it's just, it's like providing a foundation for your body to be able to take its next steps from. So I really like when people start with some kind of gentle 
not necessarily really high dose for sure, but start out with supporting with minerals. Anything you can do as well, which is going to help the immune system function better because given the immune system is really getting its, its butt kicked um, because of all the chronic inflammation and things like that that can be going on in the body. So the immune system will be on high alert. Anything you can do to help it be able to be settled and help it to function in a more balanced way can be a good, a good ad here. Um, and I would say most of us are low on vitamin D and, you know, if you take an A, D, K kind of formulation, that's probably helpful. Don't overdo vitamin A. That's the one where I, I get a little bit of the heebie-jeebies with, but a D and K, uh, you know, the, a lot of formulations have just D and K in the right proportion in something innocuous, like a drop that you can put into a drink or something. And the research on vitamin D says we need probably a lot more than most of us are getting. B vitamins are probably a longer term play, but you need to go carefully with those because they are also like putting your foot on the accelerator. So you don't want to give um, so much nutrient that your body starts up too much work and then you have systems that are getting going really high and then crashing, <laughs> really high and crashing. You also don't want to stimulate too much movement of oxalate again. And some uh, vitamins can do that, especially when you get into mitochondrial support like B6 or B1 or biotin, things like that. I think of those as like the, the three musketeers. Those are the, the big ones for oxalate for a lot of people. But, you know, some of that can be nuanced. I would always start with a quarter or less of a small dose of anything like that, where you think you might be putting your foot on the accelerator. And if you're currently doing high dose vitamin C, can you take some vitamin C? Yes. Should you be taking thousands of milligrams? In my opinion, no. A, it, it's not normal in any way to the human body to have thousands of milligrams coming in. If you're taking in vitamin C in a way that could be reflected easily in your diet, I think that's fine. Most people wouldn't be able to get more than 250 or 300 milligrams of vitamin C from whole foods. And that's only if they are really going after the highest vitamin C foods and eating a lot of them. So based on research that came out of the area of diabetes, um, there's a Dr. Bernstein who is, um, wrote the diabetes code. Like he talks about not taking more than 300 milligrams. And Susan Owens from Triangle Oxalate says, don't take more than 250. And there's some reasonable research to say that for most of us, somewhere in there is as much as we should be taking. If you were going to take for short periods of time, a bit more vitamin C, then take some of the other things that help you to recycle it, like vitamin E. And Things like CoQ10 are good for mitochondria. So that's a good one to, to add in. So, you know, I really like to play a bit with amino acids and some of these things where people can take a nutrient and perhaps the nutrient's a precursor to something the body can build that will help it. But then the body gets to decide. I like to do some of those kinds of things, which are, I think, a lot easier on us because we're not trying to force the body to do something. So there can be a lot of places to go, but I would always start with minerals first because almost a hundred percent of the people who end up in my um, practice show some signs of deficiency of at least some of the big guys like magnesium and calcium and iron. And so that's that's a really gentle place to start. And maybe even try something like Epsom salts where you get a little bit of magnesium through the skin. You don't have to stress your gut to get it. And the you know, sulfate's one of the things that oxalate competes with. You get a little bit of extra sulfate. That's going to support all that rampant liver problem and gallbladder problem that people seem to have too. I love my Epsom salt baths now. Um, Monique, do, in, in, do any folks have to be, especially mast cell folks, have to be careful with the Epsom salts because of that? People Always go slow yeah. with any supplement. I start people out with small amounts. And I don't know that 
mast cell or histamine issues in particular have to worry with um, Epsom salts, but it because sulfate does compete with oxalate. And so you can have potentially more stuff going on there, maybe oxalate being gotten rid of because you're providing sulfate in so that cell has a chance to get rid of some oxalate out. Um, I would just always go slowly with these things. And do you have, last question, I promise, do you have any issues with someone being on a typical multivitamin? We got a question submitted for you just asking if that was okay, if you thought that was fine. I would probably look to one of the higher quality multivitamins where you've got less additives because sometimes we have a problem with an additive. I don't always like multivitamins if people don't have a history of them because there could be something in there that's too much for their system to handle. And we won't know what the problem is if they react, quote unquote, to a multi. So I do like the pure encapsulations one. It's lower dose. It doesn't have a lot of junk in it. But again, if somebody takes something like that, I would say start on a quarter of a capsule, you know, throw that in a smoothie or a drink. And and see if your body handles a smaller amount before you ever work up to a whole one. It's just, there's so many things about how our bodies use nutrients that we just don't know. So I tend to start with things that are really gentle and daisy chain up to the big guys. <laughs> Monique Adinger, what an absolute treat this has been. I'm so thankful for your time today and so thankful for you and all the work that you're doing. They say, and the listeners have heard me say this before, that every day is a learning day and today is no exception. I learned so much every time I listen to you and I just want to say thank you. Where can folks go to find you online if they want to connect with you, Monique? You know, I still support, um, it's my, it's my volunteer work. I consider it my volunteer work. I still support the trying low oxalates, uh, Facebook group. Uh, I was actually the one who pressed the create button back in 2009 for that. And, uh, it's now over 57,000 people. So, I don't have a lot of time to spend on there, but they can find me there. Um, and I do, you know, answer messenger. So if somebody for some reason wanted to get in touch with me and didn't know any other way, that's one way they can find me on Twitter. So I do go to Twitter. I, I like that there's conversation there and I like that it's information rich. And so that is one of my favorite places to go. And so I'm usually on Twitter at least once a day and they can also, my DMs are currently are open until such time as, you know, perhaps it gets a little messy in there. But right now I, I talk to people on Twitter. I am on Instagram. Um, I'm still trying to sort out the whole social media and how you have enough time to do all these extra things but i am on instagram so they can find me there i try to post at least a couple times a week something there and other than that i have my own website it is www.lowoxcoach.com and i also have a patreon group that i treat a little bit like a sub stack like it's a way for people to be able to subscribe to me although they can Patreon gives them kind of a Facebook like interface where they can they can interact. And that group's a nice group because the people there are invested. And so it tends to be a group where questions are good and sharing is good. And so if people like that kind of uh, environment, I can recommend them to my Patreon group. And that is patreon.com slash Loox Coach. And so they've got got a variety of ways they can uh, they can approach me and my own website will allow them if they're interested in an appointment to actually be able to pick a time slot on my calendar and um, be able to reach out to me if they have a question. Well, I, on behalf of everyone, want to say thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you for everything that you're doing. We appreciate you, Monique. It has been an absolute pleasure chatting with you today. And I hope we can do this again. I really would love to do that and delve a little even deeper into certain subjects for folks. It's been an absolute pleasure. Well, I'd love to do that, James. Feel free. We'll uh, we'll, we'll re-engage at, uh, at a later date for round two. Fantastic. Monique, have a wonderful rest of your day. 